and my, my thing is that everything we need, we already have. Yeah. And that, that's also in that wrapped up is the, is the internal confidence to be able to put your hand up to say, I don't know what I'm doing. Hmm. So everything we need, we already have. And when you feel that, it changes everything again because that allows a confidence to say, I've got a whole heap of great stuff. <laughs> I could probably use some more. Um, how do I get that? And who hmm. do I reach out to? And where do I put my hand up? And that is about just being confidently yourself. Um, so everything we need, we have is something I really I'm, I'm, I'm going with that at the moment. <laughs> this is the Inner the Buzz podcast, helping smart businesses be even more innovative. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz. Welcome to episode number 104 of the Innova Buzz podcast, designed to help smart businesses committed to innovation, to service and to modern marketing become even more innovative. In today's interview, I was privileged indeed to speak with Jill Hicks, one of the most inspiring, thought-provoking, powerful and life-affirming speakers that I've heard. Now, inspiring is a word that's often overused and Perhaps I'm guilty of doing that too. But in Jill's case, I think you're going to agree it's totally appropriate. Jill is a survivor of the London terrorist bombings of July the 7th, 2005. She nearly died as a result of her injuries, ended up in hospital for months and suffered the loss of both legs. Her remarkable courage and determination to truly triumph over tragedy is nothing but inspirational. Now, Jill wrote the book One Unknown, which is a moving account of the tragedy of that bombing and of her survival and her inspirational journey to a new life. Now, I strongly recommend or strongly encourage everyone to read that book. Jill now speaks Publicly, she operates an international not-for-profit called MAD for Peace, M-A-D for Peace, which stands for Making a Difference. She's a very sought-after speaker, as I said, and an advocate for peace and understanding in the world. Now, without further ado, then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from the inspirational Jill Hicks. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz, and I'm really excited to have today as my guest on the Innova Buzz podcast from Adelaide in South Australia, Jill Hicks. Now, Jill is one of the most inspi- inspiring, I'm getting my notes wrong here, she's one of the most inspiring, thought-provoking, powerful and life-affirming speakers in Australia today, and I'll let her tell a little bit of her story, because if you don't know Jill's story, uh, it's quite... Um, I don't know what the right word is, but it's pretty full on and it's, um, you know, her attitude and what she does today is, there's nothing to describe it but inspiring. So Jill, welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast. It's such a privilege to have you as my guest. Thank you, Jürgen. Lovely to be here. So yeah, so Jill was publishing director of the Architecture, Design and Contemporary, Contemporary Culture magazine, Blueprint. She was director of a multidisciplinary design uh, and publishing group and she was head of curation at the UK's Design Council back in 2005 um, when all things changed for her in, in a breath, I think you call it. So tell us what happened, basically, for those people that don't know your story. Well, um, I was, uh, you know just a, a, a commuter as I would be every day in London. And um, on July the 7th, 2005, it was the only day that I was running late for work. So I was regularly someone who would be in my office by approximately 7.30 most mornings. Um, and this was one day that I was running late and, of course, not a, a day to be running late because I boarded exactly the same train carriage at the same time as a suicide bomber 
um, who turned out to be one of four uh, suicide bombers uh, with a planned attack on London transport networks uh, that morning. So the bomb went off um, at 8.50 a.m., so 10 to 9. And unbeknown to me, of course, and to everybody in the carriage that we were in, um, this 19-year-old young man um, had a, a bomb in his backpack. He was standing one person away from me in mm. the carriage and he detonated his device, killing and maiming um, many, killing 26 around me and maiming several, several um, in my immediate uh, surrounds. And life changed Forever from that moment, Jürgen, I, 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 I actually think of exactly that time as a very strong uh, demarcation mark mm. of, of the end of life as I knew it. And absolutely, fortunately and wonderfully for me, the beginning of, of another life, but uh, a very different life than I could ever have anticipated. Mm. And... For those people listening in, I strongly encourage you to read Jill's book called One Unknown, and, and you'll tell us about <laughs> how that title came about in a moment, I'm sure. Um, it's a very moving account of the tragedy of that bombing and of Jill's survival and her inspirational journey to this new life that she talks about. So now you're operating a international not-for-profit, which is called Mad for Peace, MAD, Make a Difference, and you're a very sought-after public speaker. Now, I want to give a shout-out to Fiona Kerr, who introduced us and suggested we interview Jill on the podcast. So thanks, Fiona, and um, big shout-out to you as well. She's another amazing uh, fellow South Australian. Actually, yeah. I'm very fortunate to to not only know but but, but uh, do, do lots of work with Fiona. So, yes, amazing. Hmm. So... I wondered a lot about where to take this interview today and, and you know, what to take out of this because your story is very inspirational but how to tie that in with business. And I thought of metaphors and looking at exploring the mindset that allowed you to have the incredible strength to survive that experience, not, not only to survive that experience but to turn it into what you describe as your new life and I think it's a life of purpose and selflessness and a commitment to you know, a particular cause. So, yeah, tell us a little bit about some of that. Mm. I, do you know, I think, I think the biggest thing for me that, that you know, I've had a lot of time to ponder <laughs> all of this and try, yeah. to, try to unravel it and try to understand myself. You know, what is it? What is it that's enabled me to... to Firstly, to not harbour um, a hatred or a bitterness, but to understand that if I um, channel the anger that's there, um, that I can use that anger as such a great motivator to really make some positive difference with the, the life that I've been given back. Um, for the... For the, for the um, I, I think also for the, for the sense of business, again, for me, it's even adapting to incredible change. Now, I've, I've said that I'm absolutely very fortunate to, to have survived the bomb blast. However, my body was, was incredibly maimed mm. and I now live my life with the very permanent injuries of being a double amputee, so I've lost both legs and you know that that's a that's an ever-changing feast in itself so even being um i'd rather not use the word disabled as such but being a person that that's life is then compromised in every single way and challenged it's it's continuous in how i'm having to learn to adapt and adjust to change because change didn't only happen for me at 10 to 9 on the 7th of July 2005. Change is happening then every single day after that event. Mm. So 
that in itself has been a really interesting skill to to develop to, to first acknowledge that oh okay change actually should be something that we don't look at with surprise but we should look at as it's a given that change is happening all the time around us hopefully it's so small in its increments that we that it goes barely unnoticed but sometimes it's seismic yeah. and for me it's it's how do we really, I, I think, acknowledge that we have these inherent, fantastic abilities to be able to not only face change, but to adapt and to adjust and to be quite nimble with it all. And all of that has come back around to me understanding that actually the only thing that I have absolute power over is my ability to choose how I'm going to react and respond. So I can't affect, I can't stop change, I can't do anything about it. Once I let that go, I then realised the power I do have is I've got the power of choice. Hmm. And no one can take that from me. I get to choose how I react and how I respond. And for me... That's also then coming back around to saying, how wonderful, Jill, <laughs> how wonderful that you even have a life. So the association of pain, of discomfort, of challenge, I've then bracketed into being one of the positive markers to say, I'm here, I'm here, and I get to feel stuff. And how brilliant is that? And I get to choose how I react and how I respond to every single challenge. And with that type of attitude, which, which I guess evolved quite naturally, so it's only been you know, the last few years that I've been able to recognise and call it something, um, that's enabled me, I think, to have quite a, a good, um, I would say, healthy mindset in how I evolve my own life and how I steer the direction of my life um, and, indeed, how, I, how I've gone on to, uh, to, to face some really difficult um, work challenges uh, as well as physical challenges and to be absolutely adamant that my whole driving belief is that how do I honour the life I've been given back? And for me, that's absolutely about what is the footprint I leave now? What is the legacy I leave now? And how do I, Jill Hicks, make a difference? Mm. Yeah, that's that's quite good. And and the you know having your own choices and the ability to react and respond to any situation. I think that that was one of the really powerful messages I took out of the book and some of the presentations that I saw you give um, and I've written that down and thought that that in itself is a very powerful metaphor for life and I, in fact I was, I was in a, a group that I mentor on Facebook this morning and a young person there was um, going off a tree to so to speak a little bit at a situation that was really just a trivial little thing and I thought oh, you know this <laughs> this is a little change and it doesn't really mean what it probably doesn't mean what you think it means um and you're just not reacting right you're causing yourself more grief by reacting the way you do so i think that that is a very powerful message and particularly you know if you can choose a reaction that you have chosen and a response that you have chosen in in a really extreme situation that <laughs> Not many people would be faced with then um you know that's a lesson for everybody i think yeah and i, and I think the other thing Jürgen, for me is not so much mental health but it's also been exploring mind health mm. and looking at our thoughts and and how do we become the great gatekeepers of our thoughts because that they can very very quickly take us down a path of of destructive um, almost sabotaging like action and so for me it's been very very vigilant around mind health 
and making sure that I'm always there, present with my thoughts. And the moment negative thoughts start to form, I'm aware of it and I say, come on, we need to stop that and turn this around and look at how do we make choices that are best for me mm. and best for my body and best for the outcome and, and, and best for, the, for, for honouring this short breath of time that we're here for. You know, that's, that's the other thing that's been, I think, monumental for me of, of acknowledging again just how short a time we get to be here and how important it is to let things go and really focus on what matters. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, it, it's scary in a way, isn't it, the, the time that we're here. I, I, I'm not sure this might have been before your time, but um, I was watching something on the news yesterday. It's the 50th anniversary tomorrow of the disappearance of the Beaumont children in Adelaide, which was a huge um, case at the time. And, and, you know, it's a big crime and it's a cold case. It still isn't solved 50 years later. So that's why it was on the news. And I thought, oh, gosh, 50 years, because I sort of, you know, that obviously made big news headlines at the time. And I was a, a teenager. So I'm giving away my age here. I was a teenager at the time. And I thought, um, you know, that, that had an impact on me. I thought how terrible and all the usual thoughts, I guess. And so now it's 50 years later. So, yeah, time goes by in a flash. A blink, yeah. Mm. All right. So tell us a little bit about your work then um, at Mad for Peace and, you know, how that came about and and also what each of us as individuals and also as, you know, for people that are listening here, most of whom are business owners, what businesses can do to make a difference? Mm-hmm. Um, well, so, so there's, and there's two parts to Mad for Peace. So, so again, I've been t- sort of taking some time out to explore um, the barriers to even the, 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 the word peace. And so then I've, I've started to think about, okay, I'm going to develop a sideline to Mad for Peace, which is called Mad Minds, and how we can get some great thinkers um, to, to really contribute to finding, I guess, alternatives to destructive ideologies. So the whole premise of my work is around countering violent extremism. And if you like, for, for that, you know, for, that's the long version of what the term perhaps more familiar is, how do we stop terrorism, basically. And very acutely to me, it's, you know, you can't bomb and kill an idea because an idea is what lives in people's minds, it's what's easily spread, it's what ignites particularly young minds. And so I then started to look at where are the, where are the alternative ideas? How are we luring people away from a very destructive pathway into something perhaps where they can be constructive and how, where, where is that? Where, where are we doing that? And there was no evidence that I could find. So I thought that's perhaps um, my area that I could start to, to really work in, and that is creating alternative ways, alternative ideas, or, if you like, plant the seed of doubt into those who are um, already starting to be swayed by, by this ideology. And that then then sort of, I guess, really played with my background within design. So I thought, this is fantastic. I'm now starting to be able to knit together mm. my life number one and life number two. Uh, so what, what I loved in, uh, in even thinking about speaking with you today was how difficult it is to ever communicate to anyone of exactly what it is I do. So mm-hmm. essentially, like, what is the elevator pitch? And I thought, oh, crumbs, <laughs> where do I start? Because normally I lose people at the word peace. You know? um, so for me then, I thought, well, I think if I had to make it really short and succinct, it would be that I creatively counter violent extremism by offering alternatives or alternative ideas and pathways to something that's very destructive. And um, 
So that's in a nutshell what I do, extrapolating that out. Um, it's looking at a whole range of things of uh, using my body to, to speak where there's perhaps language barriers. So I've challenged myself to do abseiling or do wonderfully choreographed pieces, um, just short films showing my body without legs, putting legs on, walking off screen, uh, all these sorts of things to show that there is the, um, the senselessness, if you like, mm. to what's happened to me and how do we make sense of that. Um, right down to I, I, I do one-to-one talks with people who, who are of a persuasion of, of a very destructive way of thinking. So there's several, several strands to the work. Um, I team up with people throughout the world who are exactly of this grain of thought, if you like, that prevention, prevention, prevention is one of the best ways we can find to to stop uh, these very you know, horrific attacks from happening. And so I work with people from in Syria, in Pakistan, in the United States, right across the the board. And it's I think we're cutting we're cutting ground. You know, for me, it's it's what's difficult from a, a I guess if you put it in terms of a business perspective is when people say, "What's your measure for success?" And gosh, you know, I, I don't have one. Hmm. But then I started to think, well, I, perhaps I need one. Um, so my, my great measure of success is to say that every day there, that there hasn't been a suicide bombing is a great day for us. And wonderfully, these occurrences are still extremely, extremely rare, um, particularly in Western countries. I, I can't vouch for the atrocities that are happening um, in, in Syria and, and, and Pakistan. Um, and indeed in Iraq, but um, certainly in, in Western countries, it's still a very, very, very rare thing indeed. And that is something I think that gives us and should give us a great deal of hope. Hmm. I think, you know, you touched on something there that I think is really important, that's creating alternatives. And I think it's also around education. I, I, you know, I keep seeing... Um, horrendous photos of, you know, senseless wars and carpet bombing and whatnot in Syria and Afghanistan and, um, you know, before that in Iraq and, and so on. And you'd think, you know, the poor people that are stuck there because, you know, they, they don't have a choice in the matter that the, you know, the politicians or the powers that be have decided to go to war with one another. Um, and, and the few people that are bent on a particular ideology and, and, taking a violent path to enforce that ideology, they're really just a very small minority as well. So you kind of feel, well, how can you, how can you break that cycle of violence? Because the next person that comes in and says, like in, in your situation, you know, that says, well, I'm going to take revenge on somebody for what happened to me, um, yeah. you know, how do you break that cycle? Yeah, and, and for me it's absolutely by the example of very clearly and very very loudly I said almost from the, the day one of this ends with me mm. and how powerful that could be if that was how everyone felt that was that suffered a, a horrific violation of this ends with me and how do we break that cycle how do we how do we then say okay this ends with me but I'm going to now look at, at a positive uh, response and that's to me the embodiment of everything I do of it's ended with me but I haven't gone back to my old life I've then decided but I will respond and I'll respond in a way that is positive and that looks at um, understanding firstly why this happened and then to say well then how how can I contribute to the demise of this very horrific, destructive way of thinking and ideology. Hmm. And I think, um, you know, what you've said on, on the homepage of your website is something that I think kind of encapsulates this and it, because it comes down to every individual um, 
behaving in a way towards their fellow human being that actually sets the pattern or sets the behavioural standard for that, doesn't it? And what you've said there is someone somewhere is feeling the effect of something you've said or done and that that's a great responsibility. Um, yeah. So, And for me, that, that I, I came up with that quote because I felt that it really explained the entirety of my whole experience, mm. both the bomber's you know, action to then the actions of every single person who dedicated themselves to, to saving my life. And so someone somewhere is feeling the effects of something you've said or done. Um, I'm, I'm living proof of exactly that quote. Hmm. Yeah, I, I really like that because, and we talked about Fiona earlier. I mean, she, I think she subscribes to this philosophy too, but we're, we're all connected to each other somewhere, somehow. Yeah. And if you take the, um, you know, the quantum physics kind of approach that, you know, and this is getting really deep and maybe very scientific and metaphysical too, but um, what we do, um, what one of us does impacts everybody else. Yes. Um, we don't know how um, and we don't necessarily know why, but um, it's certainly encapsulated by that quote you said there. And to think and about, the, to think a little bit about when you do something, um, yeah, is, is that yeah, going to yeah. really serve the world well as well as yourself? Absolutely. And I think that the thing that's been really interesting for me, uh, particularly teaming up with Fiona, is that she offers the science to my experience. You know, mm. So I can talk passionately about someone, a stranger, holding my hand. Mm. And I felt life being transformed and transported, if you like, from that stranger's hand into mine. How do I, <laughs> you know, how do I even begin to substantiate what what was that? Yeah. And this science is brilliant because Fiona's able to say this is what happened, and this is what happened to your you know, to your brain while that was happening, and this is what happened to the impact on your body while mm. that was happening, and. Yeah, th that's when this becomes really exciting. Yeah, it is. Ex it is exciting, isn't it? It really is because then it, it, it demonstrates that it, you know this isn't just the, the the sort of the the hippie you know ideology of let's just hug each other and everything will be fine. It's actually great rigor of science to say actually there's something in this and we could all thrive if we acknowledge if we understood better the power that we can have the positive power that we can have for each other. Hmm. Yeah, I, um, when I met Fiona, she gave a, a talk at a business um, networking event here and one of the points she made was about eye contact and, and we were having a chat afterwards about that and um, I was reminded of that when I read your book because a lot of the people that were involved in your rescue and then in your, um, in your recuperation, um, particularly those early on um, well, actually, it was later on when when people who hadn't who were your rescuers but didn't know what had happened to you, and then saw reports of you leaving hospital and so on, um, recognised you by your eyes. Uh, that, that, yes, you know, it was the that was yeah. the connection they had to you. To, yeah. They obviously, yeah. you know, they were looking into your eyes to try to keep you conscious in those moments. Yeah, incredible, absolutely, mm. and 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 just to just to say because of course it doesn't tr capture this in the book that um, those, all of those people now are, are like solid family members in my mm. life um, I've, I've wonderfully gone on to have a, a, a little girl she's now just turned five mm. and she was christened in Russell Square Fountain and Russell Square of course being the uh, tube station that I, my life was saved at and there's a beautiful park there in london with a great public fountain and so she was christened in this fountain and they were all there um as her god family so it's uh, just beautiful for for everything that that means you know and particularly for me it's to say to them how extraordinary their efforts were to not only then save my life but that my life has gone on to create another life and mm. um 
you know, wow, that's wow. Mm. Yeah, well, it's um, must be hard to know what to give back to those people. Yeah, just I, I, they know <laughs> yeah. because I, I, I think I track them all down and um, <laughs> stalk them and all. I, and, I said, and I just said, look, I'm sorry, but a, a Jill is for life. She's not five <laughs> seven. That's it. You've got me now, and they're just oh, you know. Um, so it's it's that they. I mean, my 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 closest friend um, is the paramedic who who was first on scene inside the carriage. Her mm. name is Tracy, and um, we've actually, you know, here we are, twelve years on, uh, thirteen years, in fact, this year with July, and you know, it's hard to actually believe that that's how we, <laughs> for all intents and purposes, met. You know, and um, because we're such such firm friends, her daughter is my daughter's best friend, and they're on FaceTime all the time. And it's just, you know, I, I, to say something's truly beautiful, I, I, I look at that, I value that relationship, and it is truly one of the most beautiful parts of, of my life to have that with her. And the continuation of it, if you like, with our children is just... It is, it is absolutely beautiful. Mm, yeah. Um, that sounds very special. Yeah. Um, we were having a conversation before we started the interview around um, how we could take some of the learnings you've, you've kind of taken for yourself out of this whole um, life-changing experience and what that might mean to, let's say, business owners who... You know, a lot of a lot of business owners they kind of live and um, exist for their business rather than their business is there for to give them a life that they love. Um, so, what what kind of lessons have you taken out um, based on where you were at before that um, bombing and and where you are now? Yeah, look, it's very it's it's sort of bittersweet for me because. I, I, you know, arrived in, in London a very young person. I'd, I'd lost both my parents and in a way that was a sort of catalyst, if you like, for me to just take a big leap of faith and to really look at, you know, if I put myself into a major world city where I don't know anyone, I don't know anything, um, I'll either sink or swim. Hmm. And so I love that sort of naivety around what I didn't know I didn't know. And in a way, I kind of miss that. I miss the naivety of youth. I wish I could keep that because I think it keeps us um, taking risks where we are quite bold in our abilities to say, whatever comes at me, I can do because we are invincible. And I think that's the, that's the gift of youth in a way, that there's this sense of I'm completely invincible and indestructible. Um, I then sort of fell into that trap, though, of, of being, being a foreigner in a, in, a, in, a, in a very tough city, working in a, in a predominantly male uh, field, dominated field, being rather short. I was only just five foot. Um, and being you know, a young Australian female. And so I, I self-imposed, if you like, an idea that I had to work, you know, not just twice as hard as everyone else, but you know, 10 times as hard mm. as everyone else. And look, and look, it did pay off. I, I ended up climbing some very impressive ranks. I was, I was very much contributing to the cultural landscape, if you like, of London. And that's extraordinary. To be able to do that, I was there for a total of uh, 26 years of my of my life. It's a place that I still call home, if you like, um, an extraordinary city. But I now look back on all of those moments where, particularly living in London, where people go to Italy and and go skiing and and go off on fantastic holidays because it's so available to do. Mm. And one moment stands out very clearly for me, and that is when friends said they're all going skiing for me to come, and I said, absolutely not. Um, I've got reports to write and, uh, you know, things to do. I'm not going. And mm. that was the last opportunity I would have had 
to know what it would have felt like to have skied with having been full bodied, <laughs> you mm. know, and and it's all of those things that I didn't, you know, I, I'd come back to Australia for you know little holidays and if you like, but I'm always working, looking at you know what I could be doing. I didn't take time out to just walk and paddle at the ocean's edge. You know, it's just like what. What was I thinking? I was in Australia, but I was still working. Um, so for me, it's. I think perhaps I would have been a better boss. Um, I, I, I had two companies while I was in London. I was in charge of a team at the Design Council. I think I would have been a better boss had I had a, 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 a sort of a, a more expansive life and I did more outside of work because I think I would have appreciated um, life in a very different way. I lived to work. And for me now, wonderfully, I still, <laughs> I still have the same habits that I had then. Um, I, I sort of said, oh, well, what the hell, I can't go skiing, so it doesn't matter. Um, but, but I think for me what's different now is that purpose is, is, sits at the core so rather than even having to think, oh, gosh, am I waking up to work, to live, to live, to work, what am I doing? Hmm. Having a not-for-profit, you know, there's, there's a hint there in even its title. There is no profit. You know, there's a whole different financial um, life that I now um, have and have to manage compared to where I was in life number one. And so that in itself is a whole different appreciation but for me, because purpose sits at the core, then, you know, everything is, is about um, what I'm doing with my life rather than how much money I'm making to fund the not-for-profit. So it's, it's a very interesting, very complete flip on um, where I was at before. But I would absolutely say it's important to take that time to realise, you know, why you're doing what you do and... You know, that there has to be the enjoyment, the fruits of your labour, so to speak, from all the hard work and effort that, that you're putting in. Hmm. That's great advice. And it, in some ways, taking time away from the work and the, you know, the office or whatever it may be actually gives you the freedom to think about purpose some more and to formulate that. And I was listening to something this morning uh, that, that was a presentation around a very successful business that's grown quite rapidly over the last five years. And and the key that this person pointed out was the moment they didn't focus on making money but started to really, well, what's their purpose and live to deliver that purpose. And it's a business, a business to deliver, uh, to make profit. But, you know, once they focused on this is our purpose, this is our audience, we have to deliver this for this audience, um, that the success started happening. So really focusing on the purpose. I totally agree with that. And, and look, it's been very interesting being back in South Australia because you know, one of the things I, I'm drawn to now is just to sit and look at the ocean and we have a, a, a wonderful coastline here. And hmm. yeah, because we, we're a quieter place perhaps than, than the larger cities of, of Melbourne, Sydney, but I, I, I almost see that as an advantage because that I'm just able to think. And, and just looking at the ocean, there's this wonderful sort of, if you like, uh, leveller of the ocean just saying, oh, you're so insignificant. You know, whatever <laughs> you're worried about, yeah. so insignificant because I've been here and I'm going to go out with my tide, I'm going to come back. And, and it's this wonderful sort of recalibration, if you like, where I then sort of smile at myself and think, yes, I'm completely insignificant and I'll go back now and um, do some more insignificant stuff <laughs> behind my computer. <laughs> yeah. But it's a wonderful thing. Nature's a great thing. And I never felt that before. You know, I mm. was really absolutely, totally engaged with, and particularly with architecture, with a very built, heavily built up urban environment mm. and stimulation that that gave me. Now I'm, I'm starting to really appreciate the the, the, the majesty and the wisdom around things that have been here far longer than I have. Yeah, yeah, and the little things as well. I noticed before yeah. there was a there was a bird chirping away very 
animatedly outside your window or wherever there in the background and I thought, oh, okay, <laughs> there's something else going on that, you know, <laughs> he or she doesn't care what we're doing. And, and it's beautiful, yeah, yeah. I, and exactly that. And that, that's, that's a moment of, of being completely present, really in tune with where you are and just saying, wow, what a, what a great day this is. You know, how mm. lovely that I get to appreciate this wonderful bird that's just popped in. You know, it's mm. fantastic. Hmm. Well, this is really fascinating, Jill. I, um, I could go on and talk for ages, but I do <laughs> respect your time. Um, we do have an innovation round that we ask people, and since you've kind of had quite a lot of business um, experience in the past, so I'm go I'll go through that now, but feel free to take this wherever you feel is appropriate, whether it's in relation to what you're doing now with Make a Difference for Peace, um, whether it's around, you know, the lessons that a horrendous event like this gave you or whatever. So, yeah. yeah. So okay. essentially the idea is that it's, a, it's a, a series of questions that will help our audience learn from tips from your experience um, yes. and hopefully inspire them which i'm sure you're quite capable of doing mm -hmm. so the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative absolutely have an open mind so not not to go into anything with already uh, the conclusion to what you're looking for but to have an open mind of what what things may come from a session of thinking mm, great advice i think you talk about um not making assumptions about people in, in some of your presentations as well. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. Uh, I, you know, just, to, just to sort of add to that, that for me, even looking at the learning of, of what, what did that bomber teach me and the bomber taught me something vital that I've absolutely brought into my whole working and life philosophy now and that is to, you know, never, ever presume anything about anyone you don't know and equally you know we can do that with anything we're looking at, we're trying to find a solution to something we can't go in presuming that we've got the answer mm. you know, having an open mind is i think the, the the foremost crucial tool to to coming out with a conclusion for anything because we don't know the answer could be buried in uh, <laughs> you know in an, in a in a in a in a sense somewhere that we would never even imagine looking um, but when we're still and we have an open mind it, it presents itself that's right yeah and it's a little bit around that uh, uh, youthful naivety that yes. you mentioned earlier but to have the curiosity to that's it. set aside judgment yeah. yeah all right so what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas um, well, rather practically, so I work, I have the whole length of, the, of my office um, as, a, as a blackboard. So everything I do is visual and, it, mm -hmm. and every word, everything goes on a blackboard and that's the way that I tease out, if you like, um, of a direction of where to go to somewhere. So it's, it's perhaps design thinking um, but I just like to see it. So for me, the best way of developing new ideas or products is to is to write down your your beginning and your pathway, and you start to see where you're going. But mm. for me, it's visual, absolutely visual. And I, I again, I hate to presume. I'll I'll generalise. <laughs> most yeah. innovators, most innovators, I would generalise to say that they're, they're they're visual thinkers. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm actually quite challenged to. Um, go into visual thinking mode but then again I do like to get up and draw on my whiteboard so yeah, and, yeah. and I do like to map out the piles so I do love that yeah there you go yeah mm. um, okay well what's what's do you have a favorite tool or system for improving your productivity I, I, I use a lot of, of design methodology so mm. that that's the, the, you know the driver for me is always the need so I start with what's the need and again, you know, having a very open mind, what are all the things that could float from the need so that we could create the right solution to fulfill that need? Um, so in essence, that's just pure, you know, I, I even like to call it common sense. You know, <laughs> I want as far to say yeah. that. But, but, but for the sake of, of making sure that we, you know, 
have the proper rigor to this, I would say it's, it's using design methodologies. Yeah, yeah, that's great advice. So, but you know what they say about common sense? It's not so common. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, what's the best way to keep a project on track? To always remind yourself and your team of the why. Mm. Why are we doing this project? Why does it matter? Why are we all sitting here, you know, trying to... To, to make it happen. So always have that reminder of, of the why, the purpose. Yeah, it's great great advice. I love, I'm a huge fan of Simon Sinek's Start With Why. Yes, um, absolutely. And, yeah, having that in mind always, I mean, yeah. it makes decisions so easy, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. All right, and what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? <laughs> And look, I think it's actually quite hard. And I'll, I'll, to follow on from what we've just said, I think it's important to believe in your purpose. So to stay true to the why. Why are you here? Why are you doing this? And, you know, I think it's, I think it's easier said than done. I think this is where a lot of people lose their way because they get caught in um, answering to their accountants to making sure that have we, have we got more profit and mm. what's my editor doing and I need to make sure I've got something that's going to outsell his or her line of whatever and we it's so easy to forget why am I here what's what's brilliant about my product and if I can't answer that then find the brilliance to your <laughs> yeah. product focus mm -hmm. on what you are doing forget about you know the the accountant forget about everyone else even if it's just momentarily put them on hold and say, I'm focusing on the brilliance of what I do. Mm. And that will be my, you know, my differentiator. That will be the thing. But um, it's, it's so, so important to stay true and to really believe in the purpose of what, what you're doing um, because that's infectious in itself. And then if, if, if you're the leader, you're the boss of, and you're, that's your attitude, um, it, it, it almost is a beautiful ripple effect that that gets reflected back in your teams, in your staff, of everyone understands why they're there, what we're doing, and how brilliant this thing is, whatever that is. Hmm. That's great advice, yeah. And believe in that and don't um, and stay true to it, so it's really yeah. good. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it, look, it is hard, and I would say that that's, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the skills that, that we've almost got to keep reminding ourselves to, to hone and to, to be working at, to say, wake up every morning and say, why am I going into work? What is it? And um, what am I going to achieve today for myself as well? What do I want to feel? And um, you know, they're, they're important things, I think, to just anchor yourself in, in your purpose and, and why you're here contributing to whatever you're contributing. Hmm. Yeah, I think you you know you, you started off saying believe in your purpose and believe in yourself, and I think that's yeah. that's probably one of the key parts of that. I think a lot of small businesses, small business owners, have a couple of things that I was on the discussion this morning about as well: um, the FOMO or fear of missing out, and yeah. the imposter syndrome. So they you know they're not yes. sure if they're good enough or if their product or services is good enough. Yeah. So then they listen to the accountant or they listen to somebody else and, and say, oh, okay, maybe I'll change direction or maybe I'll yes. make a tweak here and modify things. So, yeah, mm. so that's the danger. And, and I think that's really interesting because if, you're, if, you're, if you don't think your product is good enough, then that's, that's your reason to wake up every day to say, yeah. I'm going to make this product make brilliant. Mm. Yep. Absolutely. Focus mm. on that. Um, mm. And that, that in itself, what a great driver to say, mm. I've got a good product, but I don't think it's the best. Let's make it the best. Mm. You know, that's, wow, changes everything. Yeah, yeah. We talked earlier about, um, I think this was pre-interview as well, the um, power of words. So, yeah, that's magic. I like that. So, yeah, um, change, change the purpose imposter, a little bit. Mm. Absolutely. And if you feel that you're an imposter, then... I mean, I think I don't think it cuts it when you, when when the, the the kind of the the general response to that is look everybody feels like that because yeah yeah it's you you can't really relate to that no 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 I'm surrounded by experts you know <laughs> so so then it's okay what do I need to do to skill up 
to, to make me feel less of an imposter. Mm. Is that, do I need to read? Do I need to do courses? Um, is this the right field for me to be in? Because if I feel so insecure, then am I doing the right thing? That's my purpose where I think, great, I'm, I'm contributing. And if you still answer yes to that, then skill up. You know, it's mm. all there. Everything's there. Um, I, I, I've got another little thing that I'm really working on at the moment that I, I again, I love to ponder. I think that's a fabulous thing to do. <laughs> and um, and my, my thing is that everything we need, we already have. Yeah. And that, that's also in that wrapped up is the is the internal confidence to be able to put your hand up to say, I don't know what I'm doing. Hmm. So everything we need, we already have. And when you feel that, it changes everything again because that allows a confidence to say, I've got a whole heap of great stuff. <laughs> I could probably use some more. Um, how do I get that? And who hmm. do I reach out to? And where do I put my hand up? And that is about just being confidently yourself. Um, so everything we need, we have is something I really, I'm, I'm, I'm going with that at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's that's brilliant. I, I, I've done a lot of uh, NLP training and that is one of the core tenets of NLP, that everything we need, we have inside of us. Right. Now, it might not be the expertise relative to some other expert or specialist in their field, but you've got the know-how to get to that level if, if you want that's to, if you have the drive and, and or the purpose. I, I, and I bring this back to personal experience as well, Jürgen, that, mm. that you know, if, if I was told on the on July the 6th, the day before the bombings, you know, you will go on in life um, as a double amputee, you'll learn to walk again on prosthetic legs, um, I, I would have said absolutely no way. Mm. <laughs> there is no way I could do that. And, you know, here I am. I, I've walked the length from Leeds down to London. Yeah. Um, I've spent a month on the road, you know, on prosthetic legs, uh, done things that have stretched my understanding of myself you know, over and over and over again. And so, therefore, I'm absolutely convinced that, that, that everything I did need was already there. Mm. And it's just a matter of... of um, listening to myself and saying, absolutely, you can do that. And if you don't know how to do it, go and ask. Mm. All right. Well, as I say, this is really fascinating and I could talk for longer, but maybe we'll have a second episode at some stage. <laughs> Part two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we'll check up on you again in, in a little while. Um, what so what's the number one piece of advice you'd give then to any business owner who wants to be a leader in their field and wants to yeah. kind of be successful? I would say it's 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 so important to get the the investment, both emotionally, um, professionally, purposely, from everyone that works in your teams, so that everyone shares in the reason why why we're here, and to not exclude in that way, so that everyone's contribution is acknowledged. That they that that they all know that they're the essential cog in that wheel um, to make the outcome happen, and that to me is then creating very positive, purpose driven working environments where people are, you know, understand what they're doing actually contributes to the bigger picture, and therefore it's not just a job if you like, but they're coming to share some of their life every day to contribute to the purpose, and that's their purpose. So mm. I think it's important to, to make sure that everyone's invested in, in, in the outcome. Mm. That's, and that's really great advice, and it kind of it maybe... Sorry? And gets to share in, in the outcome of, of how, you know, what did happen, what, what yeah. was that product doing, and, oh, wow, you know, that's amazing. I, I, I got to play a small role in that, but without me, it wouldn't have happened. And I think it's really important for people to feel that, that they're valued in that way. Mm, it's good you said that last bit because I, um, when you were um, saying the whole thing, I, I was thinking back to that you actually lived that in relation to the people that were involved in your rescue and your uh, rehabilitation and, and recovery. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, and, and, and beautifully, or, or frustratingly, actually, what, when I sort of approached every single person that was involved in my, my life being saved, and I said, yeah, just, wow, how do I thank you? And, you know, one after one after one, they were each saying, I was just doing my job. Hmm. And that really got to me because I just thought, wow, you know, how is that a job? <laughs> you've, yeah. shown, you've shown me what we're capable of as human beings. So if that's what you want to call a job, then, you know, where, where do I get recruitment to, to do that or where do I sign up? You know, mm. it was just extraordinary. Um, so they've really shown me um, indeed how to not only live my second life but how to be the messenger um, and the communicator of, of all that their actions did. Mm. All right. Um, well, where can people reach out and thank you for sharing your story with us today and sharing your insights? Uh, very, very welcoming of, of email, um, which is, is Jill uh, with a G at madminds, M-A-D-M-I-N-D-S dot org. Okay, and we'll post a link to that along with the website, your website, Mad for Peace website, the Mad Minds website, and and a bunch of um, YouTube All videos stuff, that I think yeah. think are <laughs> well worth people going to have a look at because I've got so Thank much more so much. about your story, which is very moving indeed and and very inspirational what you've achieved Thank so you. far. So, so before you. we finish up, Jill, who would you like me to interview on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? Well, I would love you to speak to a very interesting man called Steve Killerly. And Steve is the founder of the Global, the Global Peace Index. And just brilliantly, actually, he, he's a businessman. He's an Australian business, businessman um, in the IT field. And brilliantly, Steve came up with the whole idea that we value and we know the economics of war, but do we mm. appreciate the economics of peace? And if peace could be provided as, a, as an economic platform for the, you know, the urgency of keeping peace and ensuring that, that peace is the absolute top of the agenda over um, the uh, very widely understood, um, you know, uh, I guess... Yeah, economics of war, then mm. would countries and, and leadership uh, be more prone to, to making sure that they adopted a peaceful model? So that's the work he does. It's absolutely fascinating. And um, a, a coming from a business perspective, he's really put a business slant on the value of peace. Yeah, that, that does sound really fascinating because I often wonder about the the whole economics of war and the drivers that, that you know, That's and it. how much do we contribute to that indirectly because we're all looking to uh, have a certain level of affluence and some of that yeah. indirectly comes back to, you know, the economy which somewhere is driven by some war stuff. So, yeah, that that would be fascinating. So, Steve, keep Steve an eye on Steve, yeah. Steve Killen. Okay, so yeah, keep an eye on your inbox. We're coming to get you Absolutely. courtesy of Jill Hicks. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, brilliant. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights with us today, Jill. I've, I've really enjoyed this. Um, as I say, I, I do strongly encourage people to buy Jill's book and read it. Um, it I read it and I was in tears a lot of the time. It's very moving. Um, but also very inspirational and also have a look at the links to the videos that I post on the on the podcast. So thanks, Jill. Thank you so much. And all the best for the future and let's keep in touch. Lovely. Thanks, Jürgen. Wow, what an amazing lady. I'm sure you'll agree that Jill is an inspirational person and that her work is so important. On a personal level, I encourage everyone to take some of the lessons of this episode on board. Now, all the ideas and tips that Jill shared with us can be found at novabiz.co forward slash Jill Hicks, that is dot co and forward slash G-I-L-L-H-I-C-K-S. 
all lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co. For, sorry, innovabiz.co forward slash Jill Hicks. Now, you'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Jill there, as well as the links to her website and a range of talks she has given, and also her book. A note for our regular listeners, we have changed the short link for our episode. So from today, we'll be using innovabiz.co, that's C-O, followed by the episode keyword. Jill suggested I interview Steve Killerly of the Global Peace Index on a future InnovaBuzz podcast. So Steve, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the InnovaBuzz podcast, courtesy of Jill Hicks. Now, you might get sick of hearing me say this next bit, but someone reminded me this week that it's vitally important to keep reminding people and that repetition is, in fact, a good thing. So if you haven't already done so, head on over to iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Cast, your favourite place to listen to podcasts, and subscribe to the Innova Buzz podcast so you'll never miss a future episode. We'd love you to leave us a review because we always welcome feedback and, of course, reviews help us get found, help us spread the message to a bigger audience and also let us know how we are doing. If there's anything you'd like us to cover, things you want us to improve or change, questions you want answered on a future InnovaBuzz podcast or indeed guests you'd like us to interview, please send those ideas to us as well. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember to be awesome and keep innovating. Mm-hmm.